disclaimer. It's a lot, a lot of blue. A lot of blue. Hey there, Ray here. As we all know, Marvel Comics is no stranger to the media. In fact, it, it actually is media. But in the 1970s, Marvel Comics was a vibrant young teenager, not knowing where to channel all of its excess energy, especially compared to its middle-aged counterpart DC Comics. What I'm saying is that Marvel was basically just shelling out their IPs left and right to whoever would take them. Some to Hanna-Barbera, some to Universal Television, some to the Patty Freelong Enterprises, and even to Toei Company. Spider! And of course, there was Charles Fry's Productions slash Dan Goodman Productions, who were responsible for the 1970s live-action Spider-Man TV series. So a year or so ago, I made a video about the 1970s Spider-Man pilot, and I've always had this weird obsession with. If you like 40 minute long, in-depth watch-throughs of old TV shows, go check it out. But if you want to get a condensed history of the old series so you can look like you know things when you talk to your friends at a typical geek gathering, <laughs> stick around. And then go watch the other video. Seriously, I, I worked pretty hard on it. Please. After this video, yeah, go. Really, please. Right over there. When it, when, when you, um, when you're done with this one, go, go ahead and, and do that. Anyway, I did way too much research on it and barely used any of this info that I've been holding on to for like a year and decided to use it all before I basically delete all of this shit. So here is everything I know about the 70s live action Spider-Man. Believe it or not, The Amazing Spider-Man was not only the first live-action iteration of Spider-Man, but was the first superhero series of its kind on CBS. When the show was being filmed, there was no Wonder Woman or Incredible Hulk. In fact, Hulk was in its mere pre-production phase, and the many other CBS superhero shows were soon to follow. So they were pretty much running blind on how they would portray a comic book character like this in a television series. It's funny, because this is like mere months before uh, CBS would be self-conscious about the amount of superhero shows they were producing. At the time this show was being filmed, there were no other shows that were even remotely like it on the air yet. So in a lot of ways, it paved the way. Z mm, Shit, I'll, I'll get this in a second. Hold on. Just, let's just do the next one. They almost changed the costume. A costume? The studio was actually going to take some liberties with the iconic Spidey suit right out of the gate. According to the book, Marvel, the characters, and their universe, the producers approached John Romita early in production about an issue with the costume. When they did the first movie, Stan was in California and he called me up and said, they don't want to make him red and blue, recalls John Romita. My first thought was, they were thinking red and blue was too much like Superman, but that wasn't it. They said they had to make him red and black, which actually would not have been the end of the world, because against the blue mat, he would have turned transparent. And I said, wait a minute, the children's television workshop solves that problem every day. They put them everywhere. They're probably telling you that because they've got a blue matte background and they don't want to repaint it. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. And the final costume for the series was remarkably faithful to its comic book inspiration. I mean, we all know it could have been a lot worse, right? Nice! Shit looks like a basketball. Now that the costume is straight, next step was to find the perfect Peter Parker to don those tights. The lead actor never even heard of Spider-Man before, and had no intention on doing anything camp. Nicholas Hammond was no slouch when it came to the acting game by this point. We're talking about a guy who made his acting debut at the age of 11, and was in the Oscar nominated The Sound of Music by the time he was 15. But he was a stranger when it came to the character of Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Well, um, I was, again, I was doing a play uh, in Los Angeles. I was doing a, an Oscar Wilde play, The Importance of Being Earnest. Who knew that the night that the CBS executives came to see the show, I didn't know they were in the audience. And the next day I got a call asking if I would come in and talk to them about playing this character I had never heard of in my life called Peter Parker. And the more I heard about it, the more interested I got. And they got interested and we all decided we wanted to just go for this and make the guy as believable and real as we possibly could. And frankly, I had no idea this kind of fan base existed. Now, I have this here, not to, not to go dookie on Hammond, but to show an example of the contrast between the 70s and today. 
If you ask any of today's spider actors about their opinions on Spider-Man, their responses are almost always typically the same. How they grew up with it and how they ran around in Spider-Man costumes as kids and watched the movies growing up. Except for Toby here, I guess. I missed the part where that's my problem. There's the meme. There he is. At this point in Spider-Man's existence, he had only been around for half past a decade. So as an actor in the 70s, you get the part of Peter Parker and you think to yourself, okay, awesome, I got a job. Not, I'm about to be part of a multi-film franchise and have my likeness loosely copied in every version of this character from here on out, have my face all over merchandise, and cameo in multiple other movies about other Marvel characters that share this fictional universe with me. For some reason that like fascinates me, I'm not entirely sure why. Truly was a different time. Stan and the fans said, nah. The most vocal fans were also the most critical of it. Who'd have thought, right? <laughs> Even worse, the man himself wasn't too keen on this interpretation. The Spider-Man TV series I was very unhappy with because very often people will take a novel, let's say, and bring it to the screen. They do a movie adaptation and they will leave out the one element, the one quality that made the novel a bestseller. With Spider-Man, I felt that the people who did the live action series left out the very elements that made the comic book popular. They left out the humor, they left out the human interest and in playing up the personality and characterizations and personal problems. To me, it was just a one-dimensional show. Stan was so unsatisfied that he actually met with the series producer, Daniel Goodman, to complain to the writers and CBS network executives that the show wasn't enough like the comics. Goodman said, My concept was to make Spider-Man more acceptable to the general audience than just to the kiddies. And perhaps there was a clash of ideologies. We had to compromise as CBS was sold on my original sales presentation of a primetime general audience show. I'm sure the main reason for its comic inaccuracies was due to budget and tech restraints of the time, but man, they could have done like Kingpin or maybe the Punisher in an episode or something, maybe. I mean, I mean, shit, throw Man Mountain Marco in there. I don't care. Damn it, you upset Stan. So I was disappointed in it, and, and it didn't do well. It didn't last very long. But Stan, it did do well. No. Oh, shit, I just interrupted Stan Lee. Does that mean I'm going to hell? It did pretty well in the ratings. The pilot aired on September 14th, 1977, and it was actually a ratings hit for CBS. The pilot garnered a 17.8 rating with a 30 share. What does that mean? Well, a 30 share basically means out of everything on TV at the time, 30% of all owned TVs were tuned into Spider-Man, and 17.8% of all those potential viewers were actually watching it. This was actually CBS's highest rated show for the entire year. Here, let's take a look. Holy, wait a second. Holy shit, the incredible hunk. Is that a typo? I find that way funnier than it actually is. Anyway, here it is. This enticed CBS to actually pick the show up for a limited five episode run. Each of these episodes also debuted very well with the first obtaining a 22.8 rating with 16.6 .6 million viewers, which not only made it the best rated program for the week on CBS, but the eighth best rated program for the week overall. The series itself actually ended up being the 19th highest rated show of the entire network season. However, uh, despite all this, it never really had a designated time slot. Wednesday, a special presentation of Spider-Man. A million dollars worth of rare coins are stolen, and Spider-Man's out to solve this baffling crime. Don't miss this special presentation of Spider-Man. Wednesday at 8, 7 Central in Mountain. Now that's a come on. So we got a show that's really killing it in the ratings, and despite, you know, fans not being happy with it, it's still making money. It's not the money. But CBS was still reluctant to commit to giving the show its own designated time slot for the 78-79 season. The reasons mainly being that the series was pretty expensive to produce and continued to underperform with their young adult target demographic. The second season, only being like seven episodes, were aired inconsistently throughout CBS's 78 and 79 
9 season. They actually would use the show itself as a time slot weapon, scheduling it to oppose competing shows at the same time slot, with plans of hurting their competitors' ratings. Around season 2, you also saw a lot of changes from the previous season. Lionel Siegel, the producer of The Six Million Dollar Man and The Bionic Woman, took over productions, trying to lean the stories even more towards an adult audience, describing his approach as being more grounded, to make it more relatable and down to earth. Which is what Spider-Man sort of was, anyway? He did this by replacing Detective Barbera with some attractive chick, and replacing this attractive chick with another attractive chick. They even went as far as toning down his powers. Yeah! Oh! More, I guess? Season 2 sort of departed even more from comic book style storytelling, and the continued lack of any recognizable comic book supervillain seemed to nudge the show even further away from dedicated Spider fans. Despite the series continuing to do well in the ratings during its second season, it still was not quite clicking with that target audience. By this point, it's fairly commonly known that CBS was worried that they would be considered a one-dimensional superficial superhero network. Wonder Woman just finished its last season, they had just finished the Captain America and Doctor Strange TV movies, and they just finished up the last season of Isis and their live-action Shazam. And the network was still airing The Incredible Hulk. Hunk. <laughs> Incredible. So dumb. So CBS was just itching to thin out their superhero content. So unfortunately, CBS cancelled the show shortly after the ending of the second season. Got him. They almost did a Hulk crossover. In a 2002 interview with SFX Magazine, Nicholas Hammond actually revealed that there were plans to do an Incredible Hulk crossover. The proposal would have had the original cast team up with the cast of the Incredible Hulk television series. A major hit for CBS. But this time, Hammond would appear in the black Spider-Man costume. According to Hammond, a deal was arranged to have Columbia and Universal Studios co-produce the project. Bill Bixby was even supposed to direct the TV movie, in addition to reprising his role of David Banner. However, Universal eventually cancelled this project. Hammond said he was told that this was due to Lou Ferrigno not being available to reprise his role as the Hulk because he was in Italy filming Hercules 2. However, in a 2003 autobiography, my Incredible Life as the Hulk, Ferrigno stated that he was never even contacted about the project, adding that he had recently finished filming the Hercules sequel and that his availability would have never been an issue. Spidey's stunt double was the sh**. Throughout the series' run, Spider-Man spun webs, clung to ceilings, swung on buildings, and climbed walls. Though at times, um, uh, question questionably. <laughs> But when it was good, it was pretty damn good. And when it was good, more than likely, there were very little visual effects involved. For these scenes, the man behind the costume was not Nicholas Hammond, but a 45-year-old stuntman and former trapeze artist named Fred Wall. That's right, I said 45 years old. At least the time of filming this. And he's been credited as working on films as recent as 2004, meaning that he was doing this stuff well into his 70s. I don't think you can do this for that long without being something of a visionary. For instance, Here's a shot where Spidey suddenly springs from a standing position to the ceiling, then runs the entire length of the hallway upside down. To do this, Wall rigged a traveling track that contained a roller that allowed a cable to move back and forth above the hallway set. The set ceiling was then built around it to obscure the track. Under his costume, Wall wore a harness attached to the cable, which ran up through the rafters of the soundstage and back down, where it was connected to a rope. Then, six stunt grips pulled on the rope, and Wall appeared to leap upwards and stick upside down to the ceiling, just like a spider. There were also these exterior shots showing Spider-Man climbing up and down the sides of buildings that were similarly done with cable rigging and were just as impressive, if not more so. And of course, there was the incredible free hanging from a helicopter stunt from season 2 that CBS sure didn't mind using in the ads for the TV show. Fred Wall pulled off a lot of these stunts with very little rehearsal or preparation due to them being pressured to film as much as possible within the smallest time frame possible. Unfortunately, uh, these stunts cost money and CBS was just looking for reasons to thin out their superhero content at the time so this too unfortunately contributed to uh, them dropping the series. It's actually a trilogy. Sporadically and by many different publishing companies, every episode of this show managed to make its way to cutting edge VHS. But outside the US, they actually tried releasing these as full-fledged movies. I'm talking about full-fledged theatrical releases. So yeah, with the pilot being considered the first movie, centering around Pete's origins as Spider-Man and his battle with the iconic villain, The Extortionist, I'm just, 
I'm just kidding. He is, he is an iconic. He's just some chubby cult guy. There were actually two others released after that. The second in the series being Spider-Man Strikes Back. Appropriately named, I guess. I mean, he, he is back. I, I don't know. In this one, Pete's friends from school build a nuclear bomb. Why? Well... You built a bomb. To prove how easy it was, we weren't going to explode it. Some rich old dude steals that nuke and then threatens to use it to kill the President of the United States and thousands of other innocent people if Spidey doesn't find it in time. This one is actually comprised of a two-parter TV episode called Deadly Dust that they just glued together and then shelled out into movie theaters. In typical late 70s fashion, it's full of white guys pretending to know karate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great job. And not white guys still pretending to know karate. I guess all you have to do is yell a lot and karate chop something. The film was theatrically released in European territories on May 8, 1978, and received a VHS release in 1980, alongside the third movie in this trilogy, being Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge, basically made up of another two-parter called The Chinese Web, which was actually the series finale. This one was theatrically released in European territories on February 3rd, 1981. In this one, JJ's old friend, who happens to be a Chinese minister falsely accused of espionage during World War II, pays him a visit and asks him to try to help him find three ex-marines that could clear his name. But of course, uh, back in Hong Kong, there's another rich old dude who is banking on him being kicked out of office. Office. So Spidey plays bodyguard, yada yada yada. Strangely enough, the production team actually filmed three to five minute new bridging sequences between these two parters to make the story easier to follow in theatrical form. All of these scenes took place in the Daily Bugle and were never part of the original airings of the TV show. Needless to say, not a lot of people dug them. Their cinematic releases were very short-lived. So short, in fact, that you can't even find any box office info on these. I can tell you one thing, though. Richard Combs from the monthly film Bulletin even went as far as describing it as a cut-price Superman that lacked any of the charm of the original comic. But, you know, that's one thing I kind of would have to disagree with. Despite its quirkiness, it does have charm. There is something about this show that just fascinates me, and I have no idea why. So there is a whole lot of information about something probably no one cares about. In the end, the show wasn't bad. It wasn't entirely great either from a technical standpoint. Don't get me wrong, though, it did get a better footing towards the end of the series as much as I may joke around about it. But what's fascinating is that this was what was done with a show about a comic book character that was at the time only 15 years old. Nowadays, there are 15 year olds that think they know everything about comic books that are 60 years old. That makes me sound like an old person. I hope not. And with all that done, we can finally say goodbye to 1970s Spider-Man. There's another random video. I probably really need to stick to uh, a certain theme with my channel if I expect it to go anywhere, but um, that's not how my brain works, so. Toodaloo. And thank you so much to whoever is watching this. Goodbye.